Um, I have the good fortune to represent the United Religions Initiative at the United Nations. And our founder was the um, former bishop, Episcopal Bishop of the state of California, William E. Swing, um, founded 11 years ago a cooperation circle of the URI called Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Um, we have a call to conscience, and I want to start this because um, he has written a prayer that has certain clauses in it that just really make me stop and think about where I am on the spectrum versus other people. And um, I would like you just to take a little time to listen with me to these words of wisdom written by William Swing. And I'm gonna start with just a little gong, bring us together. The nuclear prayer, the beginning and the end are in your hands, O creator of the universe. And in our hands, you have placed the fate of this planet. We who are tested by having both creative and destructive power in our free will, turn to you in sober fear and in intoxicating hope. We ask for your guidance and to share in your imagination in our deliberations about the use of nuclear force. Help us to lift the fog of atomic darkness that hovers so pervasively over our earth, your earth, so that soon all eyes may see light, life magnified by your pure light, light. Plus all of us who wait today for your presence and who dedicate ourselves to achieve your intended peace and rightful equilibrium on earth. In the name of all that is holy and all that is hoped, amen. Um, we start our meeting, our monthly meeting with this prayer. You can go to the URI website and see some of the people who are part of this um, cooperation circle. Some you'll recognize, such as Jonathan Granoff, um, of course, Bill Swing, um, William Perry, George Schultz. Um, this prayer has become just a core to what we do. It is something that I was fortunate to bring to Vienna. Um, I was also to the um, both the ICANN workshop and to a um, the, uh, workshop done on the moral compass organized by uh, Jonathan Granoff for the uh, Vienna conference in 2015. And to the United Nations many, many times, and particularly during the vigils that were held on an interfaith basis during the uh, treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And uh, we had our... Uh, one of the prayer vigils on the morning that the vote was taken. And so working on a spiritual level um, is an important part that we don't discuss too often. And yet we all pray that there is no nuclear war ever. And I think of the words of Martin Luther King, who said, all nuclear weapons both genocidal and suicidal. So there's nothing about nuclear weapons that even begin to make sense to us. And years ago, I had the good fortune of working with a woman who said, I'm an embroiderer. What can I do that will make a difference when there are nuclear weapons in the world? And she started a project called Ribbon Around the Pentagon. And these panels were made by people all over the world. And this one happens to show what I cannot bear to think of is lost forever in the event of a nuclear war. And this artist obviously showed. These went around the Pentagon on the 40th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They've been used at state capitals. They went around the Hiroshima dome on the same day it went around the Pentagon. But what this did was to bring people into taking action and thinking about what is it that they treasure? What is that that would get them to work to abolish nuclear weapons? People need that kind of inspiration and connection to this issue if we are going to make a difference. And one of the places to start is with our spiritual gatherings because protection of the earth, protection of people, 
protection for, for the future is something that is common, is core. The religious traditions have taken stands. The Pope gave a brilliant paper to the Vienna Conference and has the, that was just one of a longstanding um, proclamation by the Roman Catholic Church. Most religious traditions have a stand but it's not being translated into the pews. It's not being translated enough into the sermons. It's not being translated enough into care and creation of our planet. And so I think that the interfaith, the faith communities have a big job to engage in this and doing it in conjunction with the sustainable development goals, in conjunction with very special days. And the UN has created some very special days and one is of course not a UN day per se, it is a global day for us to always remember, which is August 6th and August 9th um, to remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But to keep in mind that there are international days that have been declared that can add a moral glue to us working together and one that I shamelessly promote wherever I am is the International Day of Peace, September 21st. Um, the, another one is the Day Against International Day Against Nuclear Testing, which is August 29th. And we have September 26th, the Day for the Total Elimination of Nuclear Weapons. And I noticed that in the UN's proclamation, they don't give the background on why that date was chosen. Um, on, on the website. And most of us have prob are probably familiar with the movie, The Man Who Saved the World. But on that date, 1983, it was a Russian Lieutenant General, Stanislav Petrov, who stopped what could have been the annihilation of the planet. He saved the world. And that human face, is so important for us to remember, particularly as we're moving to weapons that are not only quicker and more powerful, but the people who are manning these are people who play video games all day. How quick can I do something? How quick can I destroy anything? These are young people who have seen planets blown up on Star Wars, and they, they do it on things all the time on devices. The natural tendency to say, wait, we need to be sane, is being eroded in ways that we haven't discussed much. And I do believe that we need to take into greater account the quickness, the, the lack of, of judgment that playing video games for years and years and years and years is having on people who are in charge of setting off these missiles. So not only have we changed in some ways that we're not addressing and weapons are getting stronger, but we also have a legal device with a treaty to ban nuclear weapons. And it's, it is so strong in so many ways, along with the other treaties that have been carefully negotiated. And being blatantly disregarded. So I think it is incumbent upon us to know that if we don't do something, we are marching to war. And it won't be pretty. And we absolutely need to engage younger people. And I think the use of moving money is, is a wonderful, strong way of doing that, because that seems to be something that everybody seems to treasure more than anything. But the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons is something that needs to be re-educated. Um, I highly recommend us re recommending an old book, Hiroshima by John Hurst was the one that got me as a freshman in high school to know how horrible Hiroshima was. 
And that kind of horror is not something that our young people are sensitive to at this point. And we need to look also, and more importantly, to what they're giving up because they're spending something on spent, their future is being leveraged on something that is both genocidal and suicidal. And I don't think anybody wants that for the future. So I ask you to consider how we can reach out with both strategies, more with the faith community, to add our thoughts and prayers and to link up seriously with young people to help change the sensitivity, to open our hearts. There is a famous person in the environmental um, world called Uncle, and he talks about melting the heart of man. We have to melt that harshness that we have developed and really lead in some new directions with younger people, intergenerational, and get us back into knowing that this is a total waste of money. The emperor has no clothes.